Welcome to this Wisell Excel VBA tutorial. In this part of our series on writing SQL for Excel files, we're going to look at how you can select either all or the distinct rows from a data source. We'll begin by explaining how to add the all keyword to a query and what that does, and then look at how to return the unique values from a column using the distinct keyword. We'll look at how you can modify the sort order that's applied when you use the distinct keyword in a query, and then what happens when you use multiple columns with the distinct keyword. In the final part of the video, we'll look at how we can use our query results to provide users with a choice using drop-down lists in a user form. So let's get started. The setup for this video is basically the same as for previous parts of the series. We've got one workbook containing some VBA code, and that's going to allow us to run a query to extract data from a separate file called Movies. The Movies workbook contains multiple worksheets and tables of data containing information about films. Just a quick reminder that the Movies Workbook does not need to be open in order to run any of our code. You can happily close down the Movies Workbook and everything will still work. I'm going to keep it open simply because it makes it easier for me to point out which bits of the file we're talking to. I've got both of those files stored in the same folder and I'll drop a link in the video description so that you can download these yourselves and if you'd like to you can follow along and write the code as I do it in the video. A lot of the code that I've written in the Selecting All or Distinct Rows workbook relies heavily on ActiveX data objects. Now that's not really the focus of this series, we're focusing on the SQL side of things, but if you do want to know something about how ActiveX data objects works, or you've not done this before, then we've got a separate playlist with some information about how that works, and I'd recommend starting with this video here, How Do I Get Data from a Closed Excel File Using VBA? Just to show you the basic setup of the code, if I head into the Visual Basic Editor, We've got a simple subroutine that's triggered based on the click of the run query button on the menu sheet, and that will set the query text that we pass into a separate procedure, which deals with establishing the connection to the movie's workbook, deals with populating our record set, so this is the point at which our query gets used. I've added an extra line compared to previous videos, which is going to print out the number of rows we've returned, as well as the query which was used to produce that number of rows. And I put a bunch of extra code in here to tidy up the worksheet we create, and some error handling code as well, so that if things go wrong, at least the program will fall over slightly more gracefully than it ordinarily would. I've already set a reference to the Microsoft ActiveX Data Objects library as well, so if I head up to the Tools menu and choose References, you can see I've set a reference to the Microsoft ActiveX Data Objects 6.1 library. Just to demonstrate that this code will work, if I just head back to the menu sheet in the Selecting All or Distinct Rows workbook, click the Run Query button, that will return all of the rows from the Film sheet in the Movies workbook, so all 1200 rows and 14 columns. And if I have a look back at the immediate window, it tells me how many rows have been returned and the query used to return them. Next, let's see how we can modify the way the select statement works by adding an extra keyword after the word select. We did this in the previous video in the series using the top keyword. So we had our basic select statement, and then we said things like select top 10 and select top 10%. In this video, we're going to replace the top keyword with first of all the all keyword, and then later on the distinct keyword as well. So to demonstrate what those do, let's just modify our select statement. I'm going to change from selecting all the columns to selecting just one single column, which will be the title column. So having done that, if I just head back to the menu sheet in the workbook, if I click the Run Query button, I return a list this time of only the film titles, and the number of rows that I get is exactly the same, so 1200 rows. You can optionally add the All keyword after the word Select. Now All is a little bit redundant in this particular uh, provider that we're using to connect to an Excel workbook. If you omit the all keyword, that's what the select statement does anyway, and it's simply saying return every single row from that table based on the columns you've selected. So this will make no difference to our results at this point if I head back to Excel, head back to the menu sheet and click the Run Query button, I get the full list of all the film titles again, and once again we get all 1200 rows. Now, while the all keyword doesn't actually affect the results of your query, the distinct keyword definitely does. Let's replace the all keyword with the word distinct. And then if I head back to the menu sheet in Excel and run this query again, 
This time you can see a couple of changes, I hope. First of all, the very obvious one here is that the order of the results has changed. So we looked at adding in the order by clause to our query in a previous video. Here, the sorting of our query has been taken care of automatically based on adding the distinct keyword. So the title column is sorted alphabetically. If I also either scroll down to the bottom of this list, or even better, just head back to the Visual Basic Editor, we'll see that the number of results has changed as well. We've got fewer than 1,200. And the reason we've got fewer than 1,200 is that some films have the same title. So there are multiple instances of the same film, like I think there are three different versions of King Kong, for example. So adding the distinct keyword means that we only return the films with unique titles. The distinct keyword has a greater effect the more duplicates you have in the particular column you're selecting. So if I have a quick look back at the movies workbook and the film sheet, if we look at, for example, the genre column, there are many duplicates in that list there. So if we headed back to the Visual Basic Editor and we change the column we're selecting from title to genre, if I head back to the menu sheet and run the query again, we get just those 24 different rows of genres all sorted alphabetically. If I head back to the Visual Basic Editor and put in a different column name, let's go for the certificate column name this time. If I then head back to the menu sheet and run that, I'll return even fewer rows because there are only seven certificates in the list. So we've seen that the distinct keyword automatically sorts your query results, but you can override that if you'd like to simply by adding in an order by clause to your select statement. So let's head back to the Visual Basic Editor, and I'm just going to go back to selecting the distinct genres. So I'll say select distinct genre, and I'd like to have those sorted in descending order. So I can add an order by clause to the end of my query, and then I can refer to the genre field, and then say that I want those sorted in descending order instead. So heading back to the menu sheet, I can click the Run Query button again, and I'll get the same list of genres, 24 of them, just sorted reverse alphabetically. At this point, I'm just going to take the opportunity to head back to the menu sheet and click the Delete All But Menu Sheet button just to tidy things up. Then let's have a look at some other things we can do to change the way the distinct keyword works. The distinct keyword works out how unique a row is based on all of the columns you've included in the select list. So in theory, the more columns you include, the fewer duplicates you should eliminate. Let's just test that out by changing the genre field back to selecting all of the columns from the film table. I'm just going to comment out my order by clause at this point as well, just to avoid that having any influence. So select distinct everything from the film worksheet. If I head back to the menu sheet in Excel, click the Run Query button, I'll get all of my films returned again. And if I head back to the Visual Basic Editor, I can see that I've got 1200 rows. We can then start changing the columns. Let's go back to selecting the genre column, but then we can include on top of that the certificate column as well. So I'll say, give me the unique combination of genre and certificates. And if I head back to the menu sheet, and run that query again, I'll get um, every single genre and then every certificate that has been applied to a film in that genre. So the total number of rows I get is 109. So of course, not every genre has a uh, has every single certificate assigned to one of its films. We can see that there quite clearly with the awful genre only has the 12A certificate assigned to it. The sorting of the rows is determined by the order in which you've selected the columns. So here you can see we've sorted alphabetically by genre first and then by certificate. If we wanted to reverse that sort order, we can do this in a couple of different ways. One way is to simply change the order in which we select the columns. So back in the Visual Basic Editor, I could move the certificate column from the end of the select list to the beginning and make sure I type in a comma to separate certificate from genre and also get rid of the extra comma there at the end of the select list. So having done that, if I head back to the Excel workbook and the menu sheet and click Run Query, this time we've sorted by certificate first and then by genre within it. Now, if we wanted to have this same column order, but change the order of the rows, we could say that we wanted to sort alphabetically by genre first by bringing back the order by clause. So back into the Visual Basic Editor, let's just 
uncomment our order by clause and get rid of the extra double quote. And I want my genres to be sorted in ascending order, so I can do that in two different ways. Either remove the descending keyword entirely, or change it to ASC instead. So heading back to the menu sheet now, I can click the Run Query button again, and I'll get the same list of results, but now, although the column order is certificate first, the row order is determined by the genre. So that's basically all the distinct keyword does. It returns the unique rows based on the combination of values in all the columns you've put in your select list. So why is that useful? Well, a very common reason for wanting to generate a unique list of values is when you want to provide your users with choices. And just to demonstrate how that might work in the real world, I've created a fairly basic user form, which allows us to select films from a particular genre with a particular certificate and return those results to a new worksheet. So having a look in the Visual Basic Editor in the Forms folder in here, I can double click on my Film Picker form to see this very basic form that I've designed. Now I'm not going to talk much about form design or adding code to forms, there's a lot of code in there already. We do have other videos which explain how the code works. So heading back to um, my playlist of Excel VBA working with databases, We've got a video which explains how to populate a list box using an ADO record set and a separate playlist altogether with lots of information about how to build forms. So if you're interested in that part, that's where I'd recommend going. Just to demonstrate how this form works, if I click once on its background, I can then run that just like a subroutine. So I can click the run button or press the F5 key. And as soon as the form is initialized, it runs a query to populate the genre dropdown list with a list of distinct genres from the film sheet in the movie's workbook. So I can see in that list, I've got my list of unique genres. The certificate dropdown list is empty at the moment. I've set this one up so that when I select a genre from this list, when I move away from the genre dropdown list, it populates the certificate dropdown with all of the relevant certificates for the particular genre. So for example, if I chose the awful genre and I clicked the dropdown list, I can only select 12A films. So if I do select that, I can click the Get Films button, and all this is going to do is trigger the subroutine that gets our query results. So the same one we've been using to generate these tables. If I click Get Films, we can finally see which films are truly awful. So I've clearly ignored my own advice here and chosen very poorly indeed for this particular list of films. But let me just give you a quick run through of how the code behind this form works. It's not too dissimilar to what we've already used to populate our list of results. Um, if I head back to the Visual Basic Editor, I can get to the code behind the form in several different ways. I'm just going to do this by right clicking on the Film Picker form in the Project Explorer and choosing View Code. So the first event that gets triggered when you open the form up is the initialize event. And in the initialize event, I'm calling another subroutine which says update dropdown list. And I'm passing into that an SQL query that selects the distinct genres from the film worksheet. So just the same as we did earlier on in our basic code. I'm also passing in a reference to the particular dropdown list that I want to populate with the results of that query. So that's genre picker. And that's done in a similar way after I update the genre picker dropdown list. So this event is triggered after we've clicked on an item in the genre picker and then moved away from that combo box, that dropdown list. We check that we have actually selected something, so it's not an empty combo box. And then we call the same subroutine, this time passing in a reference to the certificate picker dropdown list and passing in a slightly more complex query. So this one's selecting the distinct certificates from the film worksheet, but with an extra condition using the WHERE clause to only return rows where the genre equals the one that we've selected. So just to show you the Get Films Click button, that's basically identical to what we've been doing in Module 1. We have a variable which allows us to build a basic SQL query. We have a quick if statement here that checks we've selected both a genre and a certificate, otherwise the subroutine just exits. We'll be, we build up our SQL query using a similar technique to the one just shown here. So we're selecting everything from the film worksheet where the genre is equal to the name of the genre we've picked and the certificate is equal to the name of the certificate that we've picked. Then we simply pass that query into the same get query results subroutine stored back in module one. The extra subroutine on this form, a private subroutine to update the dropdown list, 
we have an SQL query parameter and a drop-down list parameter which can accept a reference to a combo box control. A lot of the code in here you'll recognize already, so we've got the same checks to make sure that the movie workbook exists in the expected place, a connection string to connect to the movie file, some basic error handling code, opening up the record set and passing in our SQL query as its source, the one major bit of difference here is in how we populate the picker drop-down list. So sorry, that shouldn't just say genre picker drop-down list. That should just say generically populate the drop list. So whichever drop-down list we've passed in as a reference in the uh, second parameter gets its list populated by getting the rows from that record set and then transposing them into a set of columns. And again, we've gone into that in a bit more detail in an earlier video. So if I just point out once again, the how do I populate a list box video that explains how that works in a bit more detail. Just before we finish this video, I wanted to go back and briefly talk about the technique I've used here to build the SQL statement, which populates both the certificate drop down list and our final set of outputs. In both cases, I've built a dynamic SQL string by concatenating some literal text along with values provided by the end user. In this case, by selecting things from these two drop-down lists. Just to remind you of what the final query looks like based on my fairly poor choices that I made earlier on, I've concatenated the word awful and the certificate name 12a into the relevant part of the SQL select statement. Now we're reasonably safe using this technique in this particular example. Because I've restricted which values the user can select using drop-down lists, there's very little danger of them typing in anything potentially dangerous. But imagine we provided a slightly more open-ended user form with some text boxes that they could type into. Who then knows what naughty things your end users might try to do? So if you are ever providing your users with free text entry that you're then just going to concatenate into your select statements or your SQL strings, you definitely need to be aware of the potential for SQL injection. I provided a couple of links here for the, uh, the Wikipedia article, which describes it fairly seriously and a slightly more lighthearted approach, the cautionary tale of little Bobby tables. And if you're not sure who little Bobby tables is, have a quick look at the XKCD website. I provided a little uh, link there to the comic. Um, definitely worth a read to make you aware of the potential for um, horrible things to happen to your databases. As I say, in this example, it's not that big an issue because we've restricted which values the user can select, but I didn't want you to go away and start thinking that this was a perfect way to create dynamic SQL strings. It really isn't necessarily the best way to do it. A little later on in the series, we'll look at how we can do this properly by parameterizing our SQL strings and then doing this in a much, much safer way to prevent the possibility of SQL injection. But that's for a later video in the series. So there you are, that's how you use the distinct keyword to return a set of unique rows and why you might find that useful. In the next part of the series, we're going to go into some more detail on the WHERE clause that we've used here to apply criteria to the rows that we want to return. So we're going to include the WHERE clause in our query and explain how to write those basic criteria. So I hope you're looking forward to that one. Thanks very much for watching. See you next time.